All right, guys, we are back and we are going to be introducing Adam Block. If you guys don't know who he is, why are you here? You should know who he is by now. So without any further ado, I introduce to everybody Adam Block. Hello, everybody. How is the, the world out there? I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Ooh, so I thank you very myself. much for the uh, opportunity to, to speak today. And uh, this is on a topic that I'm really excited to talk about. So I'd like to talk a bit about the astrograph that I use on top of Mount Lemmon, which is just behind or just north of Tucson, Arizona. And I'll be describing both the science and the art that I do with that particular telescope. So that's the subject of the talk. There is one picture I wanna get out of the way right now, although we did arrange that you can see me live. There's another version of me there. That's it. Beyond that, what I'd like to do to introduce this particular talk is show uh, two videos really quickly. The first will kind of just give you a sense of the kind of science that the astrograph is doing in a pretty way. And then the second video will show you the results of some of the art that can be done as well. So I'll turn it over to Simon for a moment.
So right there at the end of the video, you saw two telescopes, the smaller one being the one that will be the main subject here, though I'll be showing you images that were taken through both telescopes as part of this talk. They're kind of complementary to one another. So in this presentation, what I'd like to do is begin actually with the science and go through what is the measurement of the brightness of the night sky, that is the photometry of the night sky. The telescope is also used for what would be called space situational awareness, basically the characterization and study of satellites that we put up there, the ones that we make that orbit the Earth. And uh, then there's another subject which is kind of interesting, not something uh, well studied, but deals with the moon. And then I'll go into some of the pretty pictures showing uh, some of the art that is possible through this telescope. And uh, given some time, I may even show a few what I would call vignettes of image processing, just a few examples of what makes the images look like they do, especially with regards to the astrograph. There are some things that are um, uh, part and parcel to wide field imagery and that el and elements of image processing help to make those images look the way they do, hopefully look compelling and captivating. So this is the astrograph in its very beginnings. Uh, there's the salient uh, detail and information about it, indicating the focal length, the camera that we're using, and most interesting, the plate scale. This is a very fast system. So the field of, uh, field of view is on the order of four and a half degrees um, with almost five arc seconds per pixel. So this is not meant for resolution. We're studying basically the brightness of the night sky, which requires no resolution. And then there is also the study of satellites that um, need only be detected at some level. Again, no resolution necessary. For pretty pictures, it's nice, but that isn't the point of this system. It's wide swaths of sky. This is uh, the enclosure. So let me just uh, have some shout outs here. Uh, first of all, the astronomer who's the primary investigator of all of this, his name is Dr. Eric Pierce. He works at the Department of Astronomy at the University of Arizona, where I work. And uh, so it is through his funding and in some sense generosity that all of this takes place because there's the science that he wants to do, but then he also gave me the ability to do some public outreach by allowing me to populate this very nice filter wheel with a few broadband color, picture, uh, color filters. And that allows me to take the color imagery. Um, also, another shout out to the gentleman who basically built this enclosure and much of the innards inside to make it um, possible to automate, which is what I worked hard to do. His name is a graduate student, Harry Krantz. So shout outs to both of those members of the team that have really been huge in making all this possible. So we visited a number of sites to measure the sky brightness. One of the places that we took this, you can travel around with it by dragging it behind a, a, a truck is uh, Kitt Peak. So this is Kitt Peak National Observatory. You saw the video, that's what it was featuring here. And what it showed is one of the kinds of observations where you basically raster across the sky to make these measurements of the sky brightness. So I'll be getting back to that shortly, but there are some more, oh, yeah, there's my video, I embedded it. There's some more um, uh, technical details I'd like to mention about the telescope and what it does that will help understand that science. And here is where it actually is right now on top of Mount Lemmon. There's another set of observatories um, that the University of Arizona maintains and operates on top of the, the mountain there. This also houses, I should mention in the background there is Catalina Sky Survey. They are well known for their detection of near earth objects and often um, the discovery of other comets as well. There's another video. To give you a sense of the field of view, here is the uh, Andromeda galaxy with the moon placed within the field. Now, this is actually an old picture, but it was taken with a, basically the same telescope many years ago, and I just put the two together. But it just gives you a sense of scale so you can appreciate how much of the sky uh, we're able to kind of uh, swallow or gulp with this particular telescope. And as a reminder, I'll be talking about magnitudes, that is the brightnesses of things. Um, here's a scale which kind of outlines a few of those numbers, brightnesses of things in the sky. The bigger the number, the fainter, of course, they are. The magnitude scale 
uh, goes in the opposite direction, and it is logarithmic. Uh, so these numbers um, increase rather dramatically when you go to one side or the other in terms of brightness. Uh, so with Pomenus, for example, which is the name of this astrograph, it's right here on the right next to the Schulman telescope. That's the other telescope that's at the Sky Center. The, uh, so Pomenus is a 0.18 meter telescope. Schulman is a uh, 0.8 meter telescope, HST is a 2.5 meter telescope, but it's in space. So you can get a sense of with typical amateur telescopes, the kind of range of uh, faint limit that you can achieve with them, HST being in space and a relatively large telescope can do really quite well. So where I begin in terms, to, in terms of appreciating the kind of science that you can do uh, to study the night sky, you need to appreciate what the sources of sky brightness are. And there are many natural sources of this brightness. They include scattered light from the stars and moon, uh, the moon, the Milky Way and stuff like that. Uh, more interesting though, that's the kind of the natural glow. There's also this air glow that is our atmosphere. Molecules in our atmosphere are excited every day. And those things, I'll show you some pictures, uh, glow during the night, through the course of the night. And that's a, a very large component of the, the brightness of the night sky. There's also zodiacal light, aurora, and so on. So let me take those in turn here. Air glow is really kind of strange. Um, I'll be showing you the spectrum of it in just a moment, but it emits light in various wavelengths. And if you take a picture such as shown here, this is a beautiful picture by Miguel Claro. It shows the banding of this air glow in the upper stratosphere and how it's um, emitting different wavelengths of light. I hope, I've never been able to take this kind of picture, but I hope to be able to do so now because I just received from Woodlands Hill, uh, Woodland Hills uh, one of these um, modified Canon cameras. So I'm very excited to potentially give that an opportunity uh, to do a picture like this myself. Zodiacal light, I have been able to see, and even from Mount Lemmon, this is the glow of light that you get scattered off of dust that's within the plane or the ecliptic um, of our solar system, and it backscatters light to us. In fact, in the direction that is exactly opposite the sun, um, in the night sky, you can get a, an enhancement of that scattered light called the Gegenschein. Aurora, of course, can illuminate and change the night uh, sky brightness dramatically. Now, from this latitude on the Earth, it's extremely rare to see a very bright aurora, but auroral activity is always taking place, especially when the sun is, is active. Um, this is a, actually a rare photo I took a long time ago where there was an extremely bright aurora that could be seen from this latitude. Uh, Kitt Peak is roughly at 31, 32 degrees north latitude, very rare to see, I never thought in my life I would ever see an aurora from here. I thought I would have to travel, but I did not. It came to me and it was a really wonderful. So the filters that are in place in this system are scientific filters. The ones that are basically, uh, well, both of these graphs show scientific filters, but the Sloan filters are the, on the ones on the bottom are the ones that we are usually using to make most of our measurements. Uh, but we also have at the top graph there, uh, one of the uh, V filters, the Johnson Cousins filter, that is also prominently used as a reference filter for making measurements. So you'll see me refer to these filters, and if you can somehow capture this in your mind, you can get a sense of what colors they are. It's not important. Uh, probably the most important one to remember there is the V filter, which is kind of like a visual band, greenish light somewhat. Now back to that air glow, uh, here's another picture of it by Yuri Betelsky. Um, Betelsky sorry. He uh, took a wonderful picture that shows some of these lines uh, that are being emitted by the Earth's night sky um, atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. And the ones that are furthest to the right, the really red ones have a name and they are captured in that filter that I, one of those Sloan filters that I just showed. Sorry, let me go back if I can that Z filter captures that particular wavelength of light. So I'll be showing you some data that I've taken through the telescope and it actually shows um, that particular banding and it's really interesting to see. So this is a major source of light in the sky. It was surprising to me when I first started to do this uh, science 
was to learn that the sky was actually brighter in the wa red wavelengths than it was in general, uh, in visual wavelengths. And that's just because of this air glow. That's crazy, but it is. So here's an example of uh, uh, the red emission that I took a picture of using the Z filter. I removed all of the stars so you can just see the banding of light. And this is when looking fairly low in the sky when I was at Kitt Peak, uh, and it showed the banding very, very well. So one of the things that I'm trying to get across in this talk is something about the night sky. And um, I will just pose this question. I don't know if this will work in this format, but I'm gonna pose the question. So this picture is a picture I took not through the small telescope, but the one next to it, which is a slightly larger telescope. It's a beautiful picture of some faraway galaxies. But this is uh, something that is very interesting in amateur um, astrophotography. You have a picture that looks like this. There is something actually kind of wrong with the picture. And I just wonder, I'm gonna pause for a second. Maybe we can just use Simon as my foil. Simon, there is something wrong with this picture. Do you wanna take a guess as to what it might be? Maybe wrong is too strong a term, but it's being characterized in a way that isn't true. Mm. I am not even remotely sure. All right, so I'll, I'll tell you the answer and we'll see if anyone else was thinking of it. The sky is dark. I have displayed the image in such a way that the sky looks black. But in reality, what I've been trying to convince you is that there are many other sources of light. And in general, the sky is not dark. It is actually a choice to display it in this way. I think that the main reason we enjoy displaying pictures like this is because when we look with our eyes, which are not terribly sensitive, at the night sky, it looks quite dark. It looks quite black. And so we reflect, we mirror, we echo that in our images, perhaps if our eyes were more sensitive and we were able to see uh, more sensitively the night sky, it would be in a way that uh, we wouldn't uh, make our images so dark and contrasty as they are. I think that's actually a function of our biology in a way. It's a preference. So a couple of people actually pointed out, clipped the sky to black. Um, that was from Christoph. And then Kevin also said uh, sky background. Yeah, well, it's not, uh, Depends on what monitor you're looking at. Uh, now on my monitor, that is not actually black clipped. So there is sky, uh, but it is quite dark. It's a very contrasty image, that's right. Okay, so having said this idea of the sky having a brightness to it, um, it is important to measure that because you have to appreciate what all the natural sources of light are, and then you measure it to determine maybe uh, the sources that might be a polluting nature, an additive form of light pollution. Uh, that can tell us something about our effects uh, on the sky, how uh, viable a particular site is for doing astronomy, all of that kind of stuff. So to make those measurements then, you need to do a form of photometry. So the measurements that I made with this astrograph are such that, I'm gonna look at this screen here. Um, I surveyed the, uh, kind of rastered across the whole sky in the following way. I took a picture of the a patch of sky, uh, relatively low, and then I moved up in altitude and I took another picture and I moved up in altitude, another picture and so on until I get to the zenith. Now I only did like five or six of these measurements per one of these altitude lines. And then you rotate the telescope a little bit. You move in azimuth and then you do it again, maybe 15 degrees and then I go up the sky again. And then I move another 15 degrees and go up the sky again and so on until I've circled the entire sky. So for a given altitude, I have a set of azimuthal measurements in a ring that go around the sky. And the density of that ring is just determined by the separation of my uh, azimuth integrals as I go across, uh, as I make my raster. So that's just to give you a sense of the, the observations that I was making. One of the things that you also need to know about the atmosphere, I guess, I, let me leave that picture back here, is that when you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere out into space, if you look straight up, you're looking through the, this graph does not show this very well, but you're looking through the smallest quantity of air when you look straight overhead. If you look towards the horizon, you're looking through much, much more air, many more air masses. If straight overhead is one air mass, then you might be looking through two air masses when you're looking at about 30 degrees. And then when you get down to 15 degrees, three plus air masses, and when you look low in the sky, 
mathematically, it kind of goes to infinity. Of course, that isn't true, but it becomes many, many air masses, which has some uh, effects that are important. Those effects, for example, is that it scatters and absorbs the light. There's a wavelength dependence to how that works. And you need to compensate for that if you're going to try to measure the brightness of the sky. The air glow, for example, um, might be either dimmed or brightened, depending upon where you are looking in the sky. And so its contribution would be important to understand. The stars, which is what you're using to measure um, the intensity of the light as a, as a reference, you need to compensate for what the atmosphere is doing to them as well. And so what you can do is the following kind of thing. You can make graphs like this. This graph attempts to show uh, a relationship between what is called a zero point and the air mass, the amount of atmosphere that you're looking through. So I'm going to break away from this and show you a quick little, kind of like a cartoon here. Here's what you need to consider so you understand where the problem is. Um, in order to make these measurements, you need to compare what you're measuring to some reference. So there exist catalogs, astronomers who have made very careful measurements of stars in the sky. And by comparing your measurements of those same stars, you can calibrate your telescope, your system to match theirs. And as long as their references and their everything that they've done is understood, you can transform your, uh, your measurements into their system. And then when you publish a paper, everyone will agree about what you've measured and, uh, and about the bright, in this case, the brightnesses of the sky will, will be understandable. So we need to get the measurements out of what are called instrumental values. That is what I measure with my instrument, but that might not match up with anyone else's uh, for the following reason. The typical way that people make measurements of uh, some reference system is they pick, now they don't do this today, but it used to be that you would pick a star and you'd say that star we're going to call like zero magnitude. It is our reference star. Today you'd use a set of stars and you do fancy math and you come up with a reference system, but it is arbitrarily chosen as a reference. So it used to be Vega. Vega is not a terribly good reference star because it's actually a variable star. Uh, but let's pretend it's a reference star. So if I have, instead of a single telescope, what if I had two telescopes that are maybe side by side? So I have my telescope and a friend's telescope and we're both looking at Vega. Let's not call it a friend. This is the professional astronomer, the first telescope here. They're the ones with the reference catalog. So if I match my telescope, my camera, everything, and we both observe Vega at the same time, we should get the same brightness of the star. And we can just arbitrarily say, hey, it's zero. You measure zero, I measure zero. It's zeroth magnitude. Everyone's happy. But if I'm using a slightly different telescope, maybe with a different camera, different filters, and so on, the measurement that I make, the brightness that I get uh, when I use my instruments is gonna be different than what the professionals have just because I'm using different detectors. You can also have the following problem. Not only could I be using say a different telescope, but let's say that um, I got there late and I started making my measurements of Vega, not when it was high overhead, but instead when it was lower in the sky. Not only am I now using different pieces of equipment, but I'm also looking through a different amount of air. All of that goes into, gets folded into what I would measure. So what I end up doing is I compare my measurements to this catalog that the professional astronomers have made, and then I compute um, that relationship. I can actually fit a line between my values and the astronomer values. And I can say, okay, here's my magnitude, what I say my instrument has, here's the magnitude in the reference catalog. So um, I can say, okay, here are the magnitudes that I measure and I'm done. It's just not quite that easy though. One of the major things that you need to compensate for is actually this air that you're looking through because the measurements that the astronomers make when they publish those catalogs, they remove uh, the contribution of the air that you're looking through. It's as if you were in space or something. That's the colors and that's the brightnesses that they put in their catalog. So I don't have that. What I have when I make these observations um, is something that looks like this, where for every, um, each of these little separations here, the, 
those are my altitudes basically. And so as I go around in azimuth, um, I have a big smear of different values that I measured. It's the same altitude, but at different azimuths and they all look kind of scattered there. Uh, so it looks like the sky has different brightnesses as I went in a ring around the sky. That's what it looks like, but hang on. And when I fit my line, uh, that is when I fit the stars that I measure to the catalog, I get something called a zero point. You can basically draw back on this fitted relationship and you can say, what's the minimum brightness that I could observe with one little count of my detector and some little period of time? There's a number that gets associated with that. Their catalog, the reference says that should be a certain brightness. And so when I graph it here on the chart, I just get a number. It's called the zero point. The number itself doesn't matter. It should be very faint. Uh, but the number itself doesn't matter other than it's what I get spit out to me. Um, when I do this um, analysis of the images, what I get are zero points at every position in the sky that I observe. And I can use that to my advantage because what I can do is I can plot the zero point that I get from the measurements compared to the amount of air that I'm looking through, the air mass. And you can draw a straight line right through those points and that gives you the correction, the coefficient of extinction, all sky coefficient of extinction, the correction you need to apply so that you take out the effect of the Earth's atmosphere. That's all this graph is allowing me to do. It's removing the effect of the Earth's atmosphere and you have to make this measurement so that then you can say what the brightness of the sky is at every point that you looked up there. Now, this was interesting because the way in which you do it, uh, this graph just shows that the sky has different degrees of this uh, extinction, this effect of air mass, uh, depending upon wavelength here. So you can see the lines are not all the same. But what you do in your data when you make this measurement, you have to compare your stars to the reference catalog. And so what you do, these are stars in my image, and you make a little aperture around the stars and you measure them, you measure the flux, you measure the amount of light that is there for many stars and then you compare them to this uh, reference catalog. But the way that the program works that we were using, it's a pipeline that processes all this information, it was automatically choosing the aperture for what it thought was optimal. And so this graph that I showed you here before, what it signaled to me is something that intuitively I didn't know a lot about, this is not my area of expertise. So by the way, everything that I'm saying right now, I hope most of it is true. <laughs> it may not be entirely true, but I hope it, most of it's true. One of the things that this graph communicates is that something was varying. As I said, I pointed around the sky at some given altitude. And for some reason at that given altitude, I had a whole bunch of different brightnesses of the sky. That seemed weird because when I looked at my data, it seemed like the data was very consistent from image to image. And there was nothing about the system that was changing dramatically. It just didn't seem to me that the graph was matching intuitively what I felt the data was communicating to me. So I searched for sources and I found this idea once I understood what the processing was doing, that it was dynamically choosing based on the, its uh, algorithm, this aperture. And it turns out that if the aperture is too small, then it messes up that measurement of that photometry. So this happens to be, I think, a special case when you have undersampled stars and we have stars as small as what you see here, um, that can be a problem when you're doing this aperture photometry. So if you make the aperture a little bit larger, where you are now sampling a little bit of the star and the sky, things become much better. Um, and this for me was like a, a really red letter day because I asked the program, please show me, don't, don't automatically calculate your aperture, show me what the aperture, uh, what you get when you have the aperture ever so slightly increasing. I wanna see what happens to the photometry. Does it change? And the answer is it did. Check it out. So this is what it looks like when the aperture was one, which is about what it was choosing, which was not very good. And then, you go to an app, well, let me just do, that was too dramatic. So that's one, and then there's 1.5. Do you see how the points get a little more clustered? And then you go to two, and they look a little better, and maybe two and a half might be somewhere near the best. 
And then three, probably the larger you make that aperture, when you start to include more sky, um, maybe the noisier it'll eventually get, because you'll start getting other stars if you make the aperture too large. So instead of dynamically choosing the aperture, I forced the program to choose an aperture that I thought uh, was a bit better, and that was near that 2.5 range. And that was huge for me. Oh my goodness, that means that the values that I was outputting were correct, uh, or certainly better than they were before. In fact, the information became so good that, it, I don't know if you notice here, this line that's drawn on the chart, it's terrible. I only discovered that the lines that I was drawing, I had a mistake in my program, my graph, uh, were incorrect once I bettered the photometry, and then I corrected it later. So this is what it looks like when you actually kind of do it right. You get a nice fit of points along that line and that correctly characterizes the correction that you need to make for the air mass so that you can calculate the brightnesses of the night sky. And this is what it looks like when you make all the measurements. I wrote a very long program to ingest this data and then plot it in this kind of polar plot. Um, and so these are the values in uh, magnitudes per arc second squared. And it uh, tells you how dark the sky is. This is actually Kitt Peak. And Kitt Peak, when you're looking straight overhead, looks quite dark. Now you might notice something though. Some of you that might have SQM measurement, uh, SQM little devices, you point at the sky and you say, well, I have 22 at my site. Uh, one of the interesting things is when you're on top of a mountain, it is easier to see the air glow because you're looking through less atmosphere. And so the sky actually is a little bit brighter uh, when you're higher up in the sky than it might be when you're lower. And of course the sky, the air glow varies from night to night and so on. Uh, but uh, in the literature, these values are actually quite good for the National Observatory, even compared to those values maybe a decade or more ago. Uh, so, you know, getting there in the mid 21s. And then uh, what's interesting, if you look at the Z band, this is where all that air glow really uh, shows its ugliness. Um, look how bright the sky is. It's like 19th magnitude per arc second squared, but several magnitudes brighter than what it looks like. Um, in the uh, visual bands, which is kind of interesting. And then this is actually what it looks like from Mount Lemon. You'll notice that at the bottom left and the bottom, um, that contribution is from Tucson. So you get a glow of light there more towards the south. But straight overhead, you'll notice that it's actually quite dark. Uh, the extra elevation, 9,000 feet, Kitt Peak is only seven, I guess helps a little bit. Straight overhead, it is almost as dark as the Kitt Peak can be. Uh, but of course, if you go anywhere else from straight overhead, the sky, of course, becomes brighter because of the contribution of the city. And then here is the Z band. You can see again, the sky is quite bright on this night, showing uh, whatever that air glow is that goes on up there. This is uh, just some, a chart which shows from some time ago, uh, the changes in the sky at some of the sites that are here in the Southwest sites that we visited with this astrograph to make these measurements. And you can see they do have a column here uh, that's for V. So those are the V numbers and they're very similar to what uh, we had measured. And of course I found that very encouraging and you can only do that after you make all of that correction stuff that I was talking about. So that's what I really wanted to indicate about the sense of doing some science, just to give you a, a taste of what you need to worry about when you're making these kinds of measurements. This is my attempt at doing something else kind of fancy. You can take the difference of two of those um, runs of measuring the sky and take the difference between them. So for example, if you wanted to know what the city lights are doing before and after midnight, how uh, businesses might shut off their lights or maybe the street lights are still being a problem because they're coming on, uh, you can you know, make measurements at the early part of the evening, later in the evening, and then take the difference of the two and see what the sky is doing. And that might give you um, other kinds of information. This is the last one of these polar plots. I'm very proud of these things because it's hard to make again. Uh, this is actually from the rooftop on campus of the Department of Astronomy, the building um, on the rooftop. I uh, made a measurement up there as well. And uh, what's interesting is that does anyone want, uh, uh, this is for Simon, my foil. Here is a picture of the sky, and here's another picture. Notice what happens, in this case, uh, the darker color means darker sky. 
So it's relatively dark here. And then something happens here. Actually, time-wise, it's actually this, and then it went to this. So it started like this, and then it went to this. You want to venture a guess? I'm on campus, what that might be? Somebody probably walked past the security light and tripped uh, it off. It's bigger than that. Oh, it's that's bigger the, than that. Yeah, that's the stadium. That's the University of Arizona stadium lights. There's a stadium that is east of the building. And when they had the lights on, the sky looked like this. You turn off the lights and uh, the sky looks like that. Even from campus, it makes a big difference. <laughs> okay. So that was my little personal story. I, I cannot tell you how pleased I was to uh, try to find out you know, something about the, how the program was working. You needed an understanding of the stuff about the physics of the sky and the stuff about how the program works and put it together and say, you know, we really got to test that. I don't believe it. And sure enough, that was the answer. So there is another element of the use of this telescope, which is for what's called space situational awareness. It is the study of satellites. And I'd like to show you just some quick examples of that. Um, this is a chart which uh, th this slide rather kind of gives you a sense of the, the motivations for this kind of study to provide rapid capability to discriminate between the different kinds of satellites that are up there. You got to keep in mind, not all satellites are currently maintained. You know, after some period of time, they might just be floating around up there and the lost to the, you know, because they're no longer maintained, they might be tracked and you have to keep track of them and so on. You got to know which ones they are. Um, you can uh, also, and I like how this is put here at the bottom, uh, under potential scenarios, uh, no, actually under general capabilities, it says allow for rapid discrimination of multiple objects. And then under potential scenarios, discriminate solar panel covered microsatellites from debris after an on orbit event. That sounds very euphemistic to me, an on orbit event. That doesn't sound like something you in general want to have happen to your satellite. So here's a, uh, now this will be interesting if this plays and looks well, I might ask Simon for verification. Here are some satellites. All I'm doing, these are geostationary satellites. So I've turned off the drive to the telescope. And here's another one. This one actually is not geostationary, but watch what happens to it. It's gonna flash at you. Did you see the flash? Let's see, I'll do it again. It's a flash there. Oh, maybe I got to go back a little more, sorry. There. So it should flash very brightly. There. That is a, a specular bit, probably some bit of the satellite, but uh, based on the brightness that you can see here, that would have been observable by your unaided eye. You would have actually seen a little flash uh, for just a brief moment from this satellite, which you wouldn't have seen with your unaided eyes otherwise. This is, the satellite is called Sirius, uh, the other one, I think we're the galaxy set of satellites. There they are again, right. And this is uh, something that uh, my colleague, Harry Krantz did just recently with the astrograph is he took a picture of TESS. Now, unfortunately it's uh, ephemeris, it's coordinates at a particular time, you need to know the rates very accurately and they were not known for us. So that when we tried to find it, when he found it, um, it doesn't look like a little dot, it looks like a little smear. But the interesting thing about it is that uh, this is uh, an interesting satellite. I encourage you to look it up, it does some cool astronomy stuff. But it's uh, at this point 200,000 kilometers out there and you're able to detect it with a tiny little seven inch telescope. So it's kind of cool to be able to do that kind of uh, work. Now, the part that I think is topical is this idea of you have these satellites in the sky. We, we live now in a world where we're putting up satellites everywhere and uh, they cross the sky all the time. When they're far enough from us, they're always being illuminated by the sun. So geostationary satellites, for example, when you look in the night sky, there's a band of them basically going along uh, what is the Earth's equator projected into the sky uh, from the equator anyway. So for us, we look down on it a little bit in our northern latitude. And you would see just all of these satellites if you had really sensitive eyes. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But when you combine images, you wouldn't necessarily want to see uh, all of those satellites. I'm going to close Photoshop here. Oh, you're not supposed to see that. 
that's okay. And I have to find the correct slide here. It's this one. What I have here is a picture, and this is the quintessential example of the Orion Nebula. Now these are just, these have been there for years, right? These are just geostationary satellites. And as the telescope tracks on the sky because of the Earth's rotation to track the Orion Nebula, uh, satellites will look like lines passing through the field. So if I blink through the images, does that show up, uh, Simon? Do you see the lines going across the frame? Oh yeah, we, it shows up really well. Okay. Looks so, like column defects. Yeah, if I blink through the frames, it looks a little bit like Star Wars. Do you see how they're crisscrossing everywhere? So all of those, if I co-add all of these images together, all of those lines are in all of the data. So what you want to be able to do is reject all of that information. Without rejecting it, what you end up with, um, I'm doing the wrong thing. What you end up with is, ah, good, is you end up with a picture that looks like this. This is the co-addition of all those frames and you would end up with all of those satellite lines going through the image everywhere, which looks kind of terrible, right? So that isn't what we're shooting for here. Instead, let me be sure I can go back. We'd like to be able to reject all of that information. So I apologize if this has been on the screen, you should tell me that kind of thing, okay. Um, let me just show you something quickly, what it looks like to reject them. I can simply combine this information using image integration. And there is a mathematical way, be sure I'm in the correct directory here. It looks like I am, star red star. There is a mathematical way of rejecting, oh, I know what I should do. Star M42, star red star, there we go of rejecting all of those satellites. And I'm literally gonna do this on the fly for you just so you can see it. The method is the following. You tell it you're gonna average all the images together, but statistically, you're gonna choose a way to reject them based on some, what's called a sigma tolerance. You're going to look for every pixel, you have a number of measurements, and then you're gonna say, if these measurements are much, much greater than the average, we're not going to include them in the average. And that is what these values here control. So I'm gonna pick something that's kind of reasonable here. Oops, like that. And we'll tell it to do the job. You just give it a moment, it'll do it, and I'll get a chance to get a drink. And here's the result. What's most interesting about this result is it gives me a map, a picture of everything that was rejected. And you can see all of the satellite lines um, in the rejected values. And so this is a mathematical way. I'm not doing this you know, by hand in some way. That's a mathematical way to remove them so that the final image, of course, shouldn't show that information or shouldn't show it well anyway. And um, you get a you get a good result for the for the for your color picture and things like that. I'm trying to stretch this. I'm not doing a very good job here. So the final result of an image that looks like this. Let's do a this. I was on it. It's something that looks like this. Now this was actually taken with the uh, the astrograph recently this this past winter. And you don't see, I hope, the evidence of the satellite trails, but yet I am able to display all of the faint nebulosity down to the very limit of what the, this telescope basically can do with the data that I got from it. So just another quick thing where all those satellites are coming from. One of the uh, interesting things that I did is I took a picture. Uh, it wasn't even with the astrograph, but it was with just a, a simple long lens and a DSLR camera um, of the entire geo belt or 
that was available on this night. It's not the entire Geo Belt, but that was available on this night. So this picture, oh, I thought it had already loaded. Sorry, it's a really big picture. It's loading here, uh, but it just goes across the sky. So this is about 60 degrees or more of sky. And I stitched all of the pictures together so that if you zoom in, you can see that, and this is something that anyone can do because you don't need a track. You just point your camera at these different pieces of sky and you take pictures with a relatively long lens and you'll see these little dots show up. Each of the little dots, if you're looking along uh, where these geostationary satellites are, there every one of them is a satellite. And I went through and I labeled them all. In fact, uh, the I don't I should have paid attention. The galaxy ones that I showed a video of earlier that were kind of clumped together, they are here, also clumped. There's Echo. There's some more galaxies, but there was a group of them. Yeah, I don't know where they are. There's a there's a serious thing. No, I'm not kidding. It's serious. Okay. So for those people who are watching this, um, yes. a lot of those satellites that we see up in the sky is actually what gives you your television, oddly enough. Um, galax most of the galaxy satellites out there are all the TV channels. In fact, if you can actually get an antenna and point it, you can actually see CNN from, say, New York if you wanted to. Yeah. Let me just show you one more thing that might be of interest to amateurs if you're if you like these satellite things, you can take pictures of the sky and then you get a satellite in your frame that looks like this, right? And I'm using Maxim DL, but satellites, they're not stationary, they move uh, and they rotate. So one of the things you can do is you can graph that, uh, um, the rotation through time. So I can draw a line here. This is using the little graph tool in Maxim DL. And if I match this line very well, let me try here. See, if I just draw it across a random piece, you just get kind of noise as it passes through stars and other things, right? But if you go along the satellite, I'm trying, something like that, you get this very nice regular pattern. And you could actually make measurements, potentially, of the uh, rotational rate of the satellite and other things just by drawing that little graph line across the satellite trail. I don't know, kind of fun things to do if you're, if you get satellites and you're, you're so unhappy to see them in your frames, well, make a cool measurement, make a graph of what they're doing. It's kind of fun. I'm gonna close this as well, there. Okay, so let me try to get back to my presentation. So that was the Earth's equatorial belt. It's our, kind of like our rings on the Earth. It's my man-made stuff. So one last topic here concerning this science that's doing, you now know, you know, the study of the night sky brightness, there's the satellite stuff. Well, there's another topic that requires an understanding of both, and it deals with the moon. One of the interesting things about the moon is that it could serve as a place to orbit satellites about. So there are some satellites running around the moon right now. Um, and you could potentially do this because you wanted to have some kind of service that makes sense from a lunar orbit. Maybe you're studying the moon or maybe you have nefarious purposes, I don't know. But if you did, there are particular orbits about the moon that make sense in terms of cost savings and energy and all kinds of stuff. So the uh, little orbit diagram that I've drawn there around the moon kind of gives you a sense of scale of where in the sky, literally near to the moon, satellites would appear as viewed from Earth. And so you can imagine if you wanted to study or keep track of satellites that are orbiting the moon, you would need an understanding of um, the brightness of the sky because when you look near the moon, the sky is very, very bright. And of course you need also an understanding of you know, the operations of satellites and motions and detecting them and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's a combination of those two ideas. So this is kind of giving you a sense that, you know, uh, if you wanted to observe these things, uh, the moon is not always available. Uh, as it orbits the earth, you know, you're going to get different geometries and different times when it's available and not. And so it might make it easier or harder to see a satellite and so on or something that's orbiting the moon. But one of the studies that we've been doing with this astrograph is 
kind of trying to understand the brightness of the sky near the moon. There are people who have studied this, not many. It's not actually a well understood thing, uh, but there are some papers that describe and characterize the brightness of the sky near the moon or very bright objects like the sun and the moon and so on. So uh, this picture that I took is only because it had a bright, I don't have very many pictures of a bright moon just overexposed, but this was one of them. Pretend there weren't any clouds here. The question is, as you go and approach the moon, what brightness, if you were to graph it, what does that graph look like? How does the brightness change as you're far from the moon and then you get closer to the moon? That's the night sky brightness that you would want to uh, understand. And it's something that needs to be potentially studied more. So here is one of the papers. It's uh, written by, among others, this Chris Siunas, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but that uh, indicates some of the formula that are required that characterize that sky brightness. And it so happens that this is a piecewise formula in the sense that there is one kind of behavior when you're far from the moon, and then it transitions to a different kind of behavior when you're near the moon. It deals with another characteristic of the atmosphere, which is that when you're far from the moon, there's something called Rayleigh scattering, which is the scattering of light you get that causes the blue sky. Um, and then there's this other effect that's based mostly on aerosols and things uh, that happen um, when you are looking in a small angle near a very bright light source, and it's called me scattering. And so those two things play off one another, and these formula that you see here, those characterize it. And these formula all together, when you put it all together in one grand thing, you can uh, try to model what the sky brightness is. And so that's what we did. I observed for real uh, the brightness of the moon, uh, the sky near the moon, and then I tried to match what this model, you know, says it should be. Uh, and that was the game. What I like, though, is what is what I've highlighted here. It says these equations are not as formidable as they might look. A pocket calculator can evaluate the brightness of the moon, sky, moon, in about a minute. And only a few lines of code are needed in a computer program. Well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this is astronomer humor because I guarantee he could not do that. Well, I mean, maybe there are specialists, not today, that can use a calculator that quickly. Maybe back in the day they could, I don't know. No, it needed a little more than a few lines of code. But with those quote unquote, a uh, few lines of code, this is what it looks like. So here I've taken pictures of the moon or of the sky near the moon and then graphed my values that I observe compared to the values as um, calculated by that equation. And there is a very good ma uh, a match. So he gets uh, good cred, good credentials, good kudos for uh, characterizing with those equations. It seems to be a reasonably good fit. Uh, but at some point it kind of breaks down when you get very close to the moon within five degrees of the moon, then things become very hard to measure. And that is kind of where things are today. If you want to make those measurements very close in, you have to be creative about how you go about doing it. This is just another example of making those measurements near the moon, but looking in the different, using the different filters so that you get a characterization of what it looks like in color uh, far and near the moon. The top graph though is an error that I made. It's another one of these examples where you, you, you know, in science you, collect data, and that may be hard. Then you analyze the data, which is kind of what graphing and things, you get it, you plot it, and that's another thing. And then there's finally, you know, you gotta understand what it's telling you. And just because it's telling you something, it might not be true. So the upper graph, you look at it and you go, well, why is that Z band? It's always, you know, air glow, something. Why is it so far away? Could it be because of that air glow thing? Is that what the atmosphere is doing? Is this something about the system? And the answer is no. The answer is the Z band is hard to take flats for. You have to take very long flats. And I neglected to include them with the other flats that are automatic. And uh, so the Z band data wasn't flatted. And so it looked bizarre. And then when you actually do it right at the bottom, everything makes more sense. And the universe is once again uh, sensible. So just wanted to show it's, uh, that's, that's the way these measurements and things go. So that's the science. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and take a drink. The other part of this presentation, the part that I hope you've been waiting for anyway, 
is where I show some of the pretty pictures. So I'd like to go through and show some images that again, taken with the system and with an understanding of this other research, now you can understand some of what goes into the creation of these pictures, um, even as so far as how to deal with the data. But I'll, I'll pause for a moment, Simon, are there any questions or something, I don't know, puzzling that people were chatting about? Is there anyone out there? Maybe I should ask that. Oh, there's plenty out there. Okay. Um, that's not even that's not even a question. Uh, one gentleman did ask about some of the pictures that you were showing with the Orion Nebula. Was how many hours worth of integration time was that? Okay. Well, this might be a good time for me to do the following. If you want to follow some of the work that I do, um, there are two websites. The first are just the images that I post, and that's at adamblockphotos.com. I've got a Kind of show that, right? If we go under Nebula, um, I always list the, you know, the the important information. The thing that makes this a, a remarkable image is that it's a mosaic of many frames, so it's not a single frame. Each frame, I didn't spend that much time on, but you know, it takes time. So a little less than three hours, 150 minutes per frame. And this is a, this is only a two frame mosaic actually. So um, this one didn't take quite as long. I'm gonna show you some others that took a little longer. Um, so this one's not bad. And that's because, you know, the region, the nebulosity in this region is actually quite bright. But these are two frames just placed side by side. And when you show, you know, the horizontal view, I, I like the horizontal view, it's easier to fit on a screen. You kind of get a sense of the relationships, which is what I hope you got when I showed that video in the beginning. Uh, the relationships between various objects, like the Horsehead Nebula being near, uh, you know, uh, Alnitak, I can't even remember the names of stars now, and um, things like that, uh, the Flame Nebula, but over here you've got the Orion Nebula, right here is the, the Keyhole Nebula, NGC 1999, things like that, the, the Running Man. So the relationship of all of these various things are, are kind of put in place when you do this wide field imagery, and then you can zoom in with other kinds of images with other telescopes to get a yet another kind of perspective. So real quick, um, how does SpaceX play into all of this with their nah. micro satellites that are well, coming out? So, oh, Space SpaceX. Are you talking about like Starlink or about just small? Starlink. Things? Yeah, Starlink. Okay. so. Uh, well, one of the things that I hope you got from what I was describing is that um, it is possible to do some things to mitigate the effect. Obviously, I demonstrated how mathematically you can reject uh, satellites from data. Now, if you're taking your pictures out with your camera, you know, looking at the sky using just a DSLR you know, with a tripod, then you can't reject them. Though, of course, as they are currently low Earth object, satellites. Uh, they won't be visible for the entire night. Uh, they won't be sunlit. But if they do move them out, then they would be sunlit for a greater majority of the night. Uh, so there's these things, but this is the state of affairs now with satellites and the, the error that we live in. I mean, the people are going to be launching satellites up there. So there's going to be, I don't know the answer, but there's going to be a balance between the science and the economy and the, um, and the service that they provide. Uh, for us here on the earth and that just needs to be managed like anything else so one more question before we move on uh if we would calibrate an image with a reference star like vega is pix insight photometric calibration a reliable tool or is there any other free or commercial software that can do that hmm. so at some point, someone's gonna ask a question where if you dig deep enough, you will start hitting the cliche of things that I don't know. And this would be one of those points. So uh, so in PixInsight, it is possible to effectively measure a flux. Uh, that, so yes, you can get photo, photometry out of PixInsight, though I think there are better tools for doing that. Um, there is one, oh gosh, Fot Utils, I forget, no, and that's the, that's the package. There, there was a, there's a software on my computer that I use to measure little apertures. It's, it's available for free. So there are some free ones, but in general, what's necessary when you're doing photometry is you got to do a lot of sources. It's not just one, two or, you know, one or two stars. 
So uh, to automate that, generally astronomers, it seems as though you end up writing your own little programs to do this, to um, interact with the data and to make these measurements in some form. So you write scripts and, uh, and so on. So I don't have a good answer for you. There, there are certainly tools that astronomers use uh, that do this all the time. Uh, in the commercial world, there are some free applications. It's not as common um, to do because it's more mathematically inclined than it is anything else. So yeah, that's my best answer right now. Excellent. Okay. All right, let's move on. Okay. So here is a, here's an image. It happens to be the first, I was very happy, first color image that I basically took successfully through uh, the astrograph. I decided to take a picture of the uh, North American Nebula and uh, it was high overhead at the time and I thought it was you know, a, a really nice thing to do, to work on. Uh, something just now, I'll talk more artistic things now, something about this field that I find interesting. A lot of people, when they, this is just an artistic consideration, they, they process this field and display it very contrasty, quite dark. Now, all of the images that I'm showing, unlike narrowband images, these are broadband images, lots of light coming through these filters. And in fact, this field is awash with light, mostly starlight. And uh, so you'll notice that I have things quite dark and contrasty where there is that darkness, uh, but not making everything else so dark. I mean, I only use this as my food uh, fiducial here, and then everything else is, you know, the corresponding brightness. So this field is actually very, very bright. Um, and, uh, and so with a large wide field, rather image, a large image like this, uh, field of view, you really get a sense of that nature of the galaxy, uh, of this object and this part of the, the plane of our galaxy. Here's another image, and it's the kind of thing that I think gives a sense of the, the perspective and scale, especially of using a very fast, uh, low resolution, if you will, system, at least at this plate scale, compared to looking at much uh, more fine plate scales. So can you see the elephant trunk here? And then um, with the uh, 0.8 meter telescope, I also was fortunate years ago to take a picture of the same. So that thing there, is the same as that thing right there. So it really gives you a sense. Here in this image, you can really see that, you know, there's some stars in the middle that are really making the whole thing glow. And then that the elephant nebula is just a small fraction of that entire nebula. Uh, and it is just um, a thicker part of it that is radially being ablated, moving, you know, um, photo disassociated. It's dissolving away. Gosh, I can't think of the right word. And, uh, and then, of course, you zoom in and you get a, a kind of different kind of story when you look at these resolutions. So I did want to try to show you a few more of these pictures, and I'm just going to, because I have the ability to do so, use my web page to do it. It's just easier. Uh, so, for example, I had there uh, the Pelican Nebula, which is one of another early pictures that I was fortunate enough to be able to, to work on. And this is a really, it just worked out really well, a really fine image of this particular region. Let's see, uh, so let's look at the full res here. Even with the small telescope, uh, the details right around here, this is another like little elephant's trunk, but you can even see the little, um, you know, bipolar outflow right there at the tip and some interesting structure at these kind of scales of the uh, dark clouds and kind of striated nature of the other bits of the dark nebulosity and so on. So I, I just thought that this was a really nice kind of representation of this particular uh, piece of sky. Then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, mosaics, of course, become something that is of interest when using an astrograph because yes, you're taking a picture of a large piece of sky, but there are even larger things at that scale to try to capture in the region around Antares and Rho Ophiuchi are, are just is fabulous. There is probably no better place in the sky for an astrograph to go hang out for a while. And so this gives a sense here of a little bit of what's going on. Here is M4, and um, I don't remember the number, NGC 6302, something like that. Uh, no, not 63, it's 60 something, 63 something. Um, and uh, this object right here is really a kind of a cool one. 
I might show you a high resolution picture of it in a moment. So when you look at something closer to just the full resolution, it's not the full, but it's much more so. You can kind of get a sense of these the clouds um, given their contrast compared to the background. So you get a sense of that depth where these clouds are in the foreground of um, everything else that you're seeing here. And this happens to be uh, uh, relatively close to us um, compared to these other features that we're seeing well beyond like M4, for example. Now, I believe that I have with the system, I took a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, very similar to the one that I showed before that had the moon, uh, but this time a little different. I handled the data a little bit differently here uh, in that I, this, I did spend a, a fairly good bit of time to capture this information. And what I discovered is that you know, when you go relatively deep with an astrograph, you really get a good sense of the contrast between the color of the sky and the objects of interest. And the galaxy has kind of a halo of glow around it. Um, and that halo is white to, um, you know, I wouldn't call it yellow, but it's almost a yellow, a little bit of a white yellow kind of color. And so I left that here, um, not having the galaxy look like somehow I could increase the contrast in blue and give it that kind of blue, you know, uh, encircling spiral structure, it really does not come out like that. Instead, there are blue highlights of the stellar associations along and within the spiral arms within the disk. Uh, but overall, it has kind of this white, yellow, white glow. Um, and then of course, reaching inwards, spiraling in with all the interesting structure and detail that, you know, doesn't come across that much here in the astrograph, but with higher resolutions, you can, you can see. One of the effects that I'd like to show given some time here is what makes an image like this possible is compressing the dynamic range. Because this, when you take this picture with the astrograph, it, the, the galaxy is overwhelmingly bright. So you have to compress the dynamic range in order to be able to show these features of the uh, spiral arms and the dust lanes that are going within at longer focal lengths, that isn't as much of an issue. Uh, so I'd like to demonstrate one of the processing things that is often done to compress the dynamic range and allow for this kind of imagery. And uh, let's see, something that's a little more topical, more recently, let's go up above then, solar system. Oh, that's the... I was going to do this one first. So this is pan stars. Uh, this was in the sky um, not too long ago, a month plus ago, and it was passing the double cluster, which is just really pretty, of course, to see a comet and the double cluster together. Anytime you get that kind of pairing and that those kinds of things happen more frequently, the larger your field of view. So the astrograph, of course, played an important role in being able to do something like this relatively well. Um, and then most currently, of course, this is what uh, on the 29th Atlas looked like. I decided just to go ahead because I liked it so much uh, to show the starless version of the comet. And then of course you eventually blend it in with the stars. Uh, so this, you remember the rejection technique that I showed for satellites? It's the same idea here where you have the comet moving against the background star. So if you align on the comet and you combine the data, as I showed, like for the satellites, all the stars will get rejected. And then you end up with only a comet image. And you can try to do the same thing to reject the comet and only end up with stars. And then you take the two images and put it together, which is the bottom image. But um, that is a, an option that is available in PixInsight. There's a nice process called comet alignment which allows you to do this. And that's what I use to create this picture. I don't wanna show you all of the images. I'm just gonna do two more here really quickly. There are lots of cool things, but I'm trying to stick to just the astrograph stuff. Uh, since I mentioned it though, there was that blue region. I think I have a picture of it. Oh yeah, this one. 
remember the little blue region that was in the uh, row of fucus area? This is what it looks like if you look at it with a higher resolution. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the page isn't there anymore, I know. Okay, anyway, that's what it looks like, higher resolution. And then finally, a question, but it has its own answer. Uh, this was also a quick kind of two frame mosaic, which is a cool nebula. I don't see it until like, there it is. Yeah, it does look kind of like a question mark, I think, uh, but this is the region near NGC uh, 7, uh, 7822, 7822. And you can see uh, at the highest resolution, you can actually see some of the detail. Let's see, here's the larger version. You can see some of the detail in here, but of course with this astrograph, you really can't get you know, what you can get if you zoom in and you see all the other features that are uh, really prominent, especially narrowband imagery when you look at the center of this object. But just having that little strongum sphere down here at the bottom really does add a punctuation literally to this image. So let me go back and show you a few of these vignettes that I mentioned. Let me just be sure that I'm getting my slides here before I forget things. Vignettes. Yeah. So not so much a demonstration. This one I'll just show as an example. But I wanted to mention something that's interesting for undersampled imagery, which is what you're doing in pictures with an astrograph like this. The stars are literally little squares, little pixels, because they fill only a single pixel. Consider that these are five arc second pixels and the seeing might be you know, less than two arc seconds easily. So the stars fit inside the pixels. Well, the same thing kind of happens if you're in space and you have a space telescope because the diffraction limit of your telescope might allow you to create stars that are smaller than the pixels of your camera. And uh, that is exactly what happens with uh, HST imagery. So there was a nice algorithm developed called Drizzle which attempts to compensate for that effect, the sampling problem uh, of that effect. So the way this works is, and this is actually taken from the manual of Drizzle, that is, the, if you look up the HST manual stuff, uh, you'll find this information in there. But at the top left, you have the picture that is basically the perfect picture. If uh, Pretend there was this big, uh, I don't know, sign out there of letters, way out there, light years away. And you had your infinitely sized telescope with infinite resolution and so on, uh, you could get infinite detail in your image. So it's perfect. It's a perfectly formed image. Now that isn't actually what you end up getting. What you actually get with even the Hubble Space Telescope, now this is disregarding the sampling problem. Pretend you had a infinitely, infinitesimally sized pixels for your detector. So the detector has nothing to do with the output image. You have a perfect detector. Uh, but you still get a little bit of a fuzz here because that's just the nature, the diffraction limit of the telescope. So that's the best you can do in terms of forming an image. It's the quality of your optics. But what you actually get with HST is the combination of that diffraction limited image plus the sampling of your, uh, of your detector. So you get an image that looks like this, and that's exactly what we get when we use our astrograph, you get these little undersampled images. So to correct for that, you use an algorithm that's called Drizzle, and you try to uh, compensate for that effect. It's kind of a cool idea. The idea is that you have your data, and uh, what you're going to do with your image is you're going to create a finer scale to operate on, or to operate with, I should say. So here is the original image. Notice the grid here is larger than on the right where the grid, the squares are literally smaller. In this case, half the size. So uh, often drizzle is um, done in increments that are like you double or triple or so on the image. So this would be a doubling. Uh, so when you have more pixels, it means you literally have a larger image as well. You literally have more pixels there. And what happens is you have a reference image which you have resampled with many more little pixels. Now that doesn't change the reference image in any way. But when you align all your other images to this reference, you do this cool trick. So that's what this is showing here, this alignment. You transform one of your images into your, um, uh, you transform it into your reference image. 
And what'll happen is you need to do something. You're gonna to need to manipulate one image to make it match another, just as we normally do. But instead of using an interpolation algorithm, instead of trying to decide, you can see that one of these pixels here in the original image now falls on different pixels in the new resampled image. You have to decide, well, how much of this information do I put in this pixel or that pixel or this pixel and so on. Um, in the normal way you do it, you look at all the neighboring pixels and you find some interpolation method where you uh, measure uh, the values between pixels and then you pick an output value. And there are many different interpolation methods, but Drizzle works differently. Drizzle literally says, pretend this is like drizzling, uh, like a drizzle of rain, like little drops of water. If you were to drip a little bit of water, pretend one of these boxes was a drop of water. Well, what you end up doing is you put this quantity's worth of the water in that pixel. There's no interpolation. And then you put the qu uh, some quantities worth in this pixel, this pixel, this pixel. So this pixel here only has a tiny little bit, some little number amount. But you don't, this is not gonna work if you only have one image, right? You don't drizzle between two images, a reference and one. You need to do a lot of images. And in that way, you end up through all of these other subsequent images, you're going to be drizzling more and more values in here. They won't always land on the same little squares. And then you will fill the information there. And the byproduct of doing it is that you're taking advantage of the extra dimension of these squares because you'll notice that I'm able to reach here, this square into other pixels because the diagonal is longer than one of the sides. So you get a little bit of extra spatial information there. And that helps basically round everything out uh, from the under uh, the undersampled images that we were seeing before. So on the left is an example of the, uh, the bubble nebula from data that was uh, courteously given to me. And uh, this is what it looks like if you just do the regular method of processing the image, you get that undersampled look with blocky little stars. Now it's a very subtle effect, but on the right, you get the result. Now I've zoomed in, I don't know if you see, that's 300%. So when you're at 100%, it's a very subtle effect, uh, but you kind of correct for that uh, sampling error. And you do it in a way that is very different than if you were to do the same, I didn't show this, but if you were to do the same thing with one of the interpolation methods, you would find that uh, the images would be much, much blurrier to the same degree, to the, especially if you display them at the same scale. So uh, Drizzle is a wonderful way to retain that uh, spatial information um, and uh, get rid of some of the sampling errors there. That happens to be the final result of uh, zooming in on this thing. I don't actually have a final image of the, that particular data, but this is, this is an image taken through a big telescope, but that's uh, another story. Okay, so Simon, according to what I see, I still have maybe, if I took another 15 minutes, that would be okay? Does that sound okay? Oh yeah, you plenty of time. Right. Um, I do have two questions if you have sure. time for I'll, that. I'll, I'll pause, yeah. Um, somebody's asking, is it better to be undersampled or oversampled if you have to pick? So I would pick always being a little bit oversampled. There are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is that there is really no downside other than if you're super, super oversampled, you're smearing the light out. Um, and so then you have a degradation of signal to noise versus the amount of time that you're willing to spend to get a particular level of signal to noise. But the fundamental answer is that uh, there is really no other bad thing that happens by oversampling. When you're under sampled, lots of weird bad things happen. This is one example. Um, let me just give you another one. When you are processing data, if you want to use a hot pixel rejection to reject hot pixels of your data, well, guess what looks like little pixels? All of the stars. It's harder to use a hot pixel filter, whereas if you're slightly oversampled, it's much easier because the pixels don't, the hot pixels don't look like stars. Um, and so, for example, you have to be sure that when you're using, um, like this telescope, undersampled data, that you dither the data uh, in order to correctly identify things that are 
uh, the same instrumentally, systematically the same from image to image because everything looks like little pixels. Uh, so given the opportunity, you want to be slightly oversampled. There is actually some criteria that's the optimum, but slightly oversampled if you have the ability to do so. When I was using the, uh, the big, you know, the 0.8 meter telescope, uh, that's imaging at 0.33 arc seconds per pixel. That means that on average, my stars are four to five pixels in size compared to one. So, you know, that's really oversampled. So next question is, what do you consider as a critical step? Is it the acquisition or the processing? Oh, well, so in terms of acquisition, this is a GIGO thing, garbage in, garbage out. It, there is no way around it. So uh, acquisition is something that it needs to be done right. It's not that it's more important important, but it needs to be done right. The processing though is really what makes the image given what you're starting with, um, whatever it is that you want, whatever goal that you have. Now for me, my goal is public outreach. My goal is to captivate. My goal is to some way communicate through the imagery. So I have goals. And so the processing to me um, really suits my end goal. Uh, for some people, that's not as critical. I mean, they just want to in some way see something and, and that's good enough. And for me, there's an nth degree. So if I give you the data that I took through the same telescope with all that carefully done right acquisition, you're going to come up with a different result from the data. And that has to do with, I'm not even talking about skill here. It also deals with an artistic rendering and interpretation and communication of the image. And that to me is, uh, is certainly very powerful. And so that, that's why I would say processing might have the upper hand on acquisition. I mean, once you've done enough acquisition, a lot of people like to fiddle. You know, I just, I really want to get the raw data so that I can start working on it. Excellent, all right, let's move on. Okay. So what I was going to demonstrate is something that's very important for wide field imagery which is, and this might not be the correct one. Let's see. Well, that, that might not be true. Uh, I wanna show uh, the correction of the background due to either, could be either. No, it's not that one, sorry guys. Um, flat field errors or other sources, you know, instrumental problems, optical problems. Yes, this is what I needed. Okay, so let me close that, that, this, and open this. Now, some of you that might follow me may have seen this before. Um, this is a pretty standard example of this, but I, I just gotta show it because it's. I think it's just a really remarkable example. Recently, I've had the opportunity to work on the Pleiades. Wonderful thing in the sky. Of course, this is topical for tonight, especially if uh, you have clear skies, you should probably go out this evening and see the Pleiades because unlike this picture, there is gonna be a very bright thing there, which is Venus it will be right in front of the sisters there. So they will have some bling um, to say the least. So here we are um, with the Pleiades and let me be sure Yes, if I zoom out, I'm hoping what is obvious here and I might be able to make it yet more obvious if I get out my uh, screen transfer function. Zoom in. Can you see that the outer part of this image looks like it has this brightness? Yes, we can yeah. totally see it. That is not a flat field error. This has something to do with the fact, I think, uh, I haven't really run it down yet, but whenever I have really bright stars in the field, there is probably uh, an internal reflection. I don't know if it is at the uh, flattener or maybe the inner tube or what surface is in there, <clears throat> but they are circularly basically scattering light. And um, it acts as if it is uh, vignetted in the opposite sense, right? You have brightness to the edge instead of darkness, which is crazy. And one of the things that people typically do with uh, DBE in and by the way, for those that are not familiar, this is PixInsight. I've already assumed that you know what this is, a processing software. And there is a function, a process that is called dynamic background extraction. 
and it will allow you to try to model all of this information and then compensate for it. So that's the idea here. And what typically happens, let me just remove this because I have the, I should have the, let me think, there they are. I have a typical example where you've placed in this image, you know, as many points as you can scattered around the image, trying to avoid the nebula, but you want to just blast the image with samples everywhere and then hope and pray that when you press this button, it somehow magically compensates for it all. I think that's hard. It's more likely to make a, an error and um, you might not see, you know, the nebulosity where it is and the corrections could be a little flaky and so on. Uh, so let me just go ahead and demonstrate that the result that you get is not necessarily, I can see stuff, but the, you know, there's an error down here at the bottom somewhere and there's kind of just this haze there, but the contrast of the nebulosity, it, I have no assurance that I've really done a very good job at the end of the day. So I want a better way to do this so I can really tell that I'm getting rid of what is apparently a fairly symmetric and global problem, which is this glow. And then, then if I still need to make another adjustment of things that are left over, it's much easier to do. And so that's what I was going to demonstrate here. What you can do is take advantage of another uh, property of dynamic background extraction which is that you can place samples like, and, and uh, let me just set this up. So, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna do five for the tolerance and I'll keep it really smooth, 0.6. We will make our little samples, I don't know, 18, doesn't matter. Uh, and that's it. Oh, so I'm gonna place this. It didn't yes. change. Your smooth factor is still at 0.25. Um, oh, it won't matter, but thank you, 0.6. There we go. Thank you, Simon. So you click here on the screen. And what I notice is that in this part of the image, I can see nebulosities here. It just so happens right around here, there just doesn't seem to be that much. So I can safely just kind of click over here and I kind of move this around so I get a space that doesn't have too many stars and things. And what I do is I claim that this point we're gonna have to, um, to have some kind of circular symmetry like this. So I make it like a circle. You know, maybe I maybe I make it a little more out here, right? And then I place another point, trying to avoid nebulosity or whatever. And then, because I need to work inward, this is obviously radial. Uh, it's a radial thing. So I go like that. And then maybe some final point, and I'm not paying attention. If I were zoomed in and messing around with the brightnesses and so on, I'd probably get a better answer. In fact, I have one there in the oven as it is, so I might show that to you. But anyway, go like this, and then we make it a circle. And then we say, okay, let's see what happens. Um, yeah, and we do that. Oh, I haven't, see this, I haven't done yet. So the correction method is division, and that's it. So this is what the model looks like. That looks pretty good to me. I think that that'll probably be a good fit for compensating for what we're seeing here. So we go, okay, and now let's actually do it for real. Oh, well, that's much better. Now I can start to see some of the stuff that is going on in this, this field. And all I had to do was do three points, three points did a majority of the work here. Now I do notice that these corners, especially the top left and the bottom right, they still need some work. Now I will not spend the time here to do it, but uh, what I should do is you will close this like this, and then you would open this and do another, one more iteration here. And you and see, I have to set it up again though. So I might still do, I don't know, three or five or something, maybe three. 0.6, and uh, you, you know, you, you make a sample there, you make the typical sample, I'm not really doing this with much care or caution.
Do I have samples? Okay, I do have a sample. Good. Can you make samples? I'm making a sample here, here. Can you see how um, careful I am being? <laughs> right? So I was not very careful about this at all. Okay. And if it doesn't work, I'll show you the one that's in the oven. But what have I forgotten? I don't know. Let's do it. Yeah, and it pretty much corrects the field. In fact, I will show you the one that was in the oven just so you can see it. Uh, but now I can really see the nebulosity and raise the contrast. And, and, and the point was, and I didn't make this earlier, I'm sorry, this is the red data. If I can see some of this outer nebulosity in red, then I really am doing a fine job here. Uh, because it's even easier to do this in the other colors. The red is the one where the, the, the signal is very faint. So having made that correction then, and then you combine the data to make a full color image, it results in a couple of things. First is that you can take the color image. Well, i just show you the final result here first. Here's the final result. Without making that correction, using DBE in the way that I did it, um, I don't believe it would have been possible for me to display all of these wonderful differences in the nebulosity that is surrounding this field. I was really striving to display the Pleiades in a way that I didn't think had been done in the same way before. I'm a big proponent of light. I like light. A lot of people like darkness. I like light. And so I just felt that displaying all of that stuff here, even at the expense of some contrast, uh, was something that was powerful. And one of the things that I love that would not have otherwise come out very well is that there are bits of maybe blue reflection stuff, and then behind them, there are these um, dust clouds. So it gives this uh, three-dimensional feel to the image as well. So all of that only came about because of that use of DBE. And in particular, one of the side products is that uh, um, I did take advantage of a starless version of this image to enhance some of that nebulosity. And again, I would not have been able to generate this starless image without that very fine, high quality um, DBE compensation. So I wanted to illustrate that for everyone. The other one that I wanted to illustrate is also very important. Okay, sorry, I'm making sure that no one is email or uh, texting me right now, which is uh, the use of that uh, compensation of the dynamic, uh, of the uh, compensation, I should say the compression of the dynamic range of an image. And in this sense, there are many objects that are very bright and this happens often, it did with, for example, the. Uh, the Orion Nebula, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, many other bright things up there require this kind of treatment. And uh, the way in which it's done is, is quite interesting in PixInsight. So there is a, a process that is called HDRMT, which is High Dynamic Range Multi-Scale Transformation Stuff, has a big name, uh, but it does some pretty remarkable things. Let me first show you an image of, this is, uh, still in its linear state here, but it's an image of the uh, Lagoon Nebula I took some time ago. Now this was taken through the 0.8 meter telescope, but I wanna show this for a different reason. So you can see here is the Lagoon and what you end up doing in order to take advantage of this compre compression is you actually display the image brighter than you otherwise would have normally done. Because what we really want here is we want to be able to see dim things and then things that are overly bright, we can batten them down a little. We can, uh, you know, prevent them from being too bright uh, with the application of HDRMT. So I'm just going to choose some level here. This is not necessarily the best level or the worst level, but there it is. And then I am going to permanently where, uh, there it is, permanently stretch the image like so. Did I get it? 
And then finally, you would apply something like HDRMT, which I will go get. So I'm just going to randomly pick something that I think is going to work. It would, it's, another, it's another lesson to uh, appreciate why I'm choosing what I am choosing here. But you choose some values that are hopefully going to knock down on the brightness here and allow you to see uh, that structure, but still also allow you to see all the cool stuff that's going on. So I'm going to apply it. This takes a moment. There you go. And what you end up with is an image that really goes a much, um, it takes you further along the path to being able to create a beautiful color picture. One of the byproducts of HDRMT, uh, HDRMT is that you gray the image a little bit and making an image gray can be very powerful, especially if you're gonna be blending color with it. When the image is very bright, it's very difficult to colorize the image, especially when doing LRGB imagery. And that's what I was doing in this particular case. But I used HDRMT, I used this process here on the entire image. That is not typically how it works because the calculation of these brightness levels that you're choosing to compress is done across the entire image that you're working on. And so if you have a small object in a large field of view, such as this, the calculation that you get isn't going to be representative of what you need for just the object. It's only going to apply to the entire field, which may or may not be useful. So what you end up doing is choosing a preview and working on the object, but only um, around this region, and then basically writing that information back into the image. And I'm going to show that to you. Uh, but first, let me show you the end. Yeah, I'll show you the end result of the of the lagoon. So with the application of HDRMT, now you can really start to see all of these wonderful structures here all the way into the center, um, as well as, you know, to the outskirts and all the dim stuff. This is the uh, very nearly the full resolution here. So wonderful things going on within the nebula. Now that, of course, this is what you get with a, uh, a 0.8 meter telescope. Keep in mind, this is not narrow band imagery. This is just RGB, this is broadband imagery. And I can get this level of contrast mostly because of this dynamic uh, compression of the dynamic range in the image. Okay. So back to this one. This is a galaxy which obviously needs, there is no way to linearly display this galaxy. Um, if I choose, let, let's be sure that I'm doing this here. This, is this already a stretched? Ah, this might already be a stretched image. Let me see. I can't remember if this is a stretched image. Yes, so this is a stretched image. So um, what I was going to demonstrate is there is no way in the linear space that I could somehow display this image and show both what's going on inside and what's going on with all the faint outer structure. This galaxy must have been perturbed at some point in its life. It has all kinds of crazy shells and tidal things going on here. Um, inside though, it's very difficult to see, but it has this wonderful edge on galaxy. It is an edge on galaxy with this outer halo that's just bizarre. This obviously requires HDRMT. So we will get out HDRMT again, and I'm going to apply it, but only apply it here to this image. Now, the number of layers deals with the scale and size of things that I want to operate on. I had a moment ago something like seven when I was operating in such a way that I was interested in the large scale structure of the lagoon. Here, we can make this perhaps a little smaller in both of these scales. Um, and Gaussian is fine, that's fine. So this should do a reasonable job and maybe, maybe I should leave it at seven here, I don't know. I can't remember what I actually chose. Yeah, it's probably better. Okay, so this might be something closer to what I'm looking for. Now you can really see this wonderful edge on galaxy in here, as well as the outer structure. But um, the good news about HDRMT is that one of the things you'll notice is that, uh, let me undo and redo. Can I, yeah. 
Notice how the background brightness remains the same here. It does a wonderful job of still maintaining the same sky brightness. That's going to allow me to do the substitution of this image here in just a moment. But the, um, the wonder that it does on the galaxy, it does a little harm to the stars. You'll notice that stars get a little bigger and fatter. Let me go on and off here. It's hard to see that. They get a little bit bigger and fatter in the process of applying this. And of course, the very brightest stars here develop something that's kind of like a ringing effect. You get kind of a darkness running them, you get kind of a weird thing going on in the center there. All of those things we don't really want. So I'm not going to construct it. I'm just going to pull it out here, which is that uh, such a thing you can make is a mask that looks like this. And this mask would do the job of um, taking care of the stars that are within this image so that the stars are not a problem um, because you protect them from the effects of HDRMT. So let me show you how it all works. What you do is I make an image here of that preview exactly how I want it, except that I need it to be in the state before in the adjustment, sorry. Let's undo that. There. So there's the preview. And I know that I've done it around the object. So I know HDRMT is going to get the right kind of values for the brightness and do its job. Then we can apply here my mask. We do, I'll turn off the showing of it. We do the, the job, which is here. Now you'll see that I've mitigated the effect of showing the, the badness that happened around the stars. They don't look weird in the center. They don't have a, much of a halo ringing effect going on. I see what I see and so on. And then the final thing that I do is I need to put this thing back into here. So there are a couple of ways of doing it. There is a substitute by preview. There is a way to do that with a thing, but it, it's overly complicated. So I made uh, my own little script, which does that. And I should have it right, not script, I should call it an expression. You just put it into pixel math and I'm trying to get to it here. So all of this, by the way, this kind of stuff is available. I believe it, I have this open to everyone on my website, um, which I'll show you in a moment as a last thing. So does anyone see insert? Here it is. So all I need to do are find these values here, which I actually need to write down right now. So the values are, so I have uh, 1335, 1542, 1527 and 1167. So all I'm going to do is just put that into my expression to the bigger image. That's all this thing is going to do. 42, 1527, and 11, yeah, I know you guys remembered it. 1167. All right. Go okay. Oh, I got to do one more thing. Got to change the name here. In fact, I'm going to change the name of this thing to make it easier to type. Not that thing. Sorry. Where's my little, this thing. This thing should be HDRMT. All right. That is not the one I dragged though. There's my mask. That's the one I want. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I have too many of these things. HDRMT1. There we go. Because I had some pre-made. HDRMT1. I believe that should work, but let's see. Ta-da! And I will remove the preview. And now you see in place, in situ, if you will, I have put this modified version into there 
you know, I had the mask on and everything. There's actually another way to blend it, but in this case, it didn't matter. There is no uh, demarcation. There's no way to tell that I've done that neat trick. Um, now I could, there is no reason why I couldn't have done HDRMT to the whole field and then masked the stars. And then really all I'm operating is on the sky, but that's just silly, that's, that's dumb. There is no difference between me doing this as a substitution and me doing this globally and masking everything. So I just make a small image and substitute it back in and I have more control. It's easier for me to work with that small image than it is for me to work with the entire image sometimes for masking and other reasons. So there you have it, another very powerful processing tool or technique that is often comes into play when doing wide field, doing imagery in general, but especially doing some of the wide field imagery. So the final result of that image is this guy. Here is what that galaxy looks like after that treatment. And what's nice, of course, is that when you're able to display the innards of this thing, it has these wonderful little bluish bits at the end, which are probably, again, you know, the spiral, it's probably a spiral galaxy. And you can see the dust lanes in here, uh, maybe a little stuff, as well as the outer structure of the galaxy. So if any of this kind of information interests you, I would highly encourage you to go to another website of mine, which is called atomblockstudios.com. And it is here that I offer all kinds of um, content on processing astronomical images. I have lessons, uh, most especially these days, it's all on PixInsight, but I also have uh, the other information here as well. Uh, there's a fundamentals where people can purchase for one time purchase. You get access forever to the entire content of uh, the entire archive and content of that stuff. And there are, uh, how many hours? I don't even know how many hours. Most people, it takes months for them to go through all of the videos that I've put together just in fundamentals. And by the way, if anyone is interested, it is fundamentals that you want to start. And then I have a growing collection of things here in my other, um, my other section, which is called PixInsight Horizons. It's here that I have lessons on individual, how to process individual data sets where you get the data so you can follow along with me. Um, in addition to that, I also have other lessons that are on different techniques, um, some of which are innovations that I've developed all on my own, uh, like uh, star de-emphasis and things like that. So you'll only find them here, right? Yeah, you gotta sell it. So there you have it. Um, and on a last note, if anyone's interested, uh, because of what is going on in the world today, it, you know, it's harder to, to go out and do things. So I am now offering office hours with Adam. If you would like to reserve some time um, to, you have just some problem, you can't figure it out and you go to a forum and it, you really just need to be shown, you need to work with your data. See the hard part is work with your data and your picks in sight, make it work. That's what I can potentially do because you can go join me and online we can work. I can work on your machine, try to solve a problem. And um, I have some experience doing that, doing workshops. So it's something that uh, comes naturally to me. And if there's any interest, you can email me for more information. And with that, I promise to be wrapping up at four, right? So it is oh, yeah. well, 3.55, so. 3.55, I mean, we, we're gonna cut this one. Well, I mean, if you're pretty much done, don't forget we've got one more video we've got to play. And then we're probably gonna take a break for around about 20 minutes. So we're gonna delay uh, Chris Go for about 20 minutes. Okay, um, that last video, it, you can play my video, but if there are any questions, I'll, I'll ask them or answer them. That last video is not necessary. It's just a nicety. I, I didn't really need it at this point, but it's cool no, if you wanna we'll play, play it. we'll play it for these guys. Uh, okay. I, think, I think everybody's just like, uh, their jaws have just dropped and hit the ground, uh, to be totally honest. Okay, <laughs> well, you know, this was a talk that was uh, not prepared, right? Because this, I was only told last Friday, or something. Um, so uh, this was extemporaneous. This is what it sounds like when I do things on the fly. But uh, you know what, in all honesty, uh, um, and I say this on behalf of everybody from Woodland Hills Cameron Telescope and uh, here on the chat, I, I think we've probably learned more in the last two hours watching this than we probably have done with anything else that we've ever done. I mean, 
I've never seen the Pleiades cluster look like that ever. Yeah. And I have imaged that thing countless times. I've not gotten anything as close as that. It's just mind boggling. Absolutely mind boggling. Yeah, the, the wide field helps. And then the, the combination of some of these techniques of uh, working with the data um, obviously can give you that kind of result. And uh, when employed for that purpose, it can be powerful. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, you guys who are watching at home right now, I really do highly recommend that you check out Adam's website if you haven't already. And if, like you, like, like you said, if you get stuck, take advantage of these office hours. I mean, that's what it's for. I mean, yeah, I do have a cat, just so you yes, know that you can hear her going nuts. <laughs> she just wants attention now. Mine so, left the room about an hour ago, so. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we're gonna open it up for like last minute questions. We'll try and take one or two, um, and then we're gonna go on a 20 minute break roughly before we bring on Christopher Go. Uh, I gotta eat something. I've been sitting here for the last three, four hours and I haven't really moved and I need to go to the bathroom and all sorts. Well, I'll take a couple of questions and if you wouldn't mind just as a fade out playing that last video, of course. it's another nice one to show the wide field work with uh, zooming into some of the high res stuff. So one of the questions is, how do you compare HDRT to LHE? Obviously this is in PixInsight. Yes, this is. So um, LHE, I think of uh, its uh, local histogram equalization, I think. I think of that like an effect, which is similar to, um, if you worked in the Photoshop world, it's, it's almost like a soft light um, blending mode where you really make things, you, you know, you make things that are dark, much darker. So it, it really increases the contrast and things that are bright kind of get brighter where HDRMT does not give you more contrast. In fact, it probably does the opposite. It gives you less contrast, but it allows you to see more brightness levels simultaneously. So they're really two different ways of interacting with the data and they give you two different outcomes. Next question is, what is your thoughts on binning? Um, just by the way, I have a problem with that word sometimes because I pronounce it as binning. Yeah, no, I'm, it, that, sorry. Because you put it in a bin, not a bind. It's binning. It, it, it's literally going in a bin. Okay, anyway. Um, so uh, my thoughts about binning are, you, I am someone that has, that has worked with binning data because I've used oversample data, especially when I've been using a large telescope. Um, I do that because there is a benefit, a time savings. Now this is an argument and there's a big argument and I'm not gonna go into it, but there is a time savings you do potentially, not in all cameras, not all the time, but you can potentially um, get a better signal to noise result because you are uh, doing better against the read noise when you bin. You get a better signal to noise when you bin compared to the read noise because you're only reading once per that pixel, which is now a super pixel. And the benefit of that is that if that is true, I can save time when I collect my color data and just use more time for the luminance to match those signals so I'm coloring everything I'm getting in my luminance image. This was very important to me when I was running programs and I had people come to the telescope and they wanted to collect data and I spent the night with them, but we only have a limited amount of time. So I need to get as much of that data as I can and give it to them and binning the color helped. Now with the astrograph, no binning. There's no benefit to binning. In fact, you hurt yourself with binning. Um, so all of that data, of course, is taken unbinned, just straight up RGB, no binning at all. No benefit to binning. In fact, even with the big telescope, if I had a very bright object, there's no benefit to binning. It's really about faint objects and beating the read noise. If that's a true statement, it can help. Okay, last question. Um, what was the focal length that you used to do the Pleiades shot? So that was with the astrograph and its focal length is 500 millimeters. It's an uh, F, uh, whatever, 2.8. Yeah. Um, which astrograph were you referring to? The Epsilon, this, right? This is the Pomenus, the one that, that I've been showing the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys are obviously interested, we sell the Epsilon. 
Uh, I've been twitching to get a hold of one of these for a very, very long time. We do actually currently have one or two in stock at the store. So if you're trying to recreate something similar to what Adam has obviously done with, you know, varying levels of success, of course, then, you know, you guys are more than welcome to uh, have a poke around on our website and check out what is going on. I believe there are some specials. Um, I think there are people still ready to take your phone calls and things like that. So check out our website, uh, telescopes.net. Otherwise, you can give us a call on 888-427-8766. And this is my cat. Um, she kind of looks like a black hole because she's a black cat, so all the light just gets absorbed by her. So you can't really see her very well. Is there so on that note, <laughs> thank you very much, Adam. Okay. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right. So play the outro and uh, thank you guys very much for uh, joining me this afternoon. I had a great time. Thank you. <laughs>